Welcome back to Christian's Colloquy. I'm Christian, and I'm so glad that you could join me again this week. Today, we will be continuing our series on congregationalism by looking at, discussing, unpacking what congregationalism looks like today in my Baptist context. If you've seen it and remember, in the previous episodes of this series, we were discussing John Cotton's famous foundational work, The Keys of the Kingdom of Heaven, where in that work, Cotton, as a Puritan minister, unpacked what congregationalism looked like back in the 17th century. We discussed how that work was influential on other famous Puritans, such as John Owen, the famous Prince of the Puritans. But today, we're going to look at congregationalism as it stands in the 21st century, what a Baptist elder thinks about congregationalism. And as I was preparing this episode, thinking about different ways I could approach this, I realized, wow, there's a lot we could say about congregationalism. There's so many different aspects of church polity we could discuss, so many different realities of church governance that we can unpack. And I thought, how can I approach this topic and get into what's actually going on without boring you or going on or hitting up too many different directions where it becomes confusing. So after mulling it over for quite some time, I landed on the approach of just taking you through uh, my church's statement of faith as, uh, as we have a small paragraph on the local church. And this is uh, a statement of faith, not only of my particular Evangelical Baptist Church, but this is the statement of faith of our broader association, our, our fellowship, the Fellowship of Evangelical Baptist Churches in Canada. So we'll be looking at that paragraph. It gets into a bit more than just polity. It talks about ecclesiology. And for those who might not be familiar with the term, ecclesiology just refers to, it's getting into to what the church actually is, our theology, our understanding of the church body itself. But we're going to look at this paragraph. I believe I can roughly divide it into three sections, and we'll just walk through it, see what it says, what it means, but also talk about what it implies beyond what is written and what it doesn't say that we actually practice. Of course, statement of faith, you, if your church has one, you probably know it's relatively short. It's not as long as reformed confessions of faith as they used to be in the 16th and 17th centuries, but uh that's what we use today, that's what we have today, and that's what's going on today in Baptist churches. So I thought, what could be more appropriate than me sharing with you what is in our statement of faith today? So anyway, that's the intro. We're going to walk through it. And as I go through it, I want to note two things. I'm going to bring up a lot of the terms that people will use that you might have heard or haven't heard, but that's what's being taught in seminaries or theologians are talking about. So I will highlight some key terms describing different positions or uh, concepts. And I will make sure if you're interested in any of these key terms that I highlight down below in the description, you will find all sorts of different resources. So if you're interested in this conversation, definitely look down below. I'll have articles, I'll have lectures and podcasts and different things to help you get started on uh, a deeper exploration of congregationalism and the various themes. Uh, more than that, I also just want to note as we're going through this, there are a lot of things I am unpacking here or presenting, and this is, I'm trying to keep it brief. So if you're interested in any of these particular topics, if you perhaps want me, this is an intro, so I won't be getting into detailed biblical cases or I won't even get into defending the positions too much, just laying it out there. But if you're interested in, hey, you brought up this term, can you give us a biblical presentation of that? Can you compare and contrast that against this other position? If any of those uh, catch your interest, make sure to reach out to me. Let me know in the comments. Send me an email, however you can reach out to me, and I will probably have an episode on it in the future. I want to discuss what you want to hear about. So if anything catches your interest or sounds interesting or you never heard that before, you're wondering why do people believe this, check the description for resources and or let me know so that I can unpack it further in a future episode. All right, with all that said, let's dive into my church's statement of faith on the local church. I will read it all out at the start and then we'll break it down into the three parts. Here it is. The local church. We believe that a church is a company of immersed believers called out from the world, separated unto the Lord Jesus, voluntarily associated for the ministry of the word, the mutual edification of its members, the propagation of the faith, and the observance of the ordinances. We believe it is a sovereign, independent body, 
exercising its own divinely awarded gifts, precepts, and privileges under the Lordship of Christ, the great head of the church. We believe that its officers are pastors and deacons. Already, you probably heard how this statement of faith uh, section on the local church dives into a few different topics. And just thinking about that whole thing, I think we could see it really unpacking three aspects of ecclesiology, church life, and church bodies. The first section, right at the top, which we'll get to in a moment, gets into what the church actually is. When we're speaking of a church, a local church, who are we talking about? The second part that I will again discuss gets into how the local church fits into the broader scene. And that, of course, as we will unpack, uh, implies some comparison and you could see some historical development where uh, we're defining ourselves with a mind of what else is going on out there in terms of church structure and polity. And that final part, it's just a brief little sense, uh, sentence, talks about the officers of the local church. That's where you get an idea of structure and government inside the local church. So those are the three sections. Let's just handle them now piece by piece by star uh, starting with who the church is or what is a local church. Let me read that first bit again. We believe that a church is a company of immersed believers called out from the world, separated unto the Lord Jesus, voluntarily associated for the ministry of the word, the mutual edification of its members, the propagation of the faith, and the observance of the ordinances. So what is that saying? Well, it's saying a lot of things, but I will try to keep it simple. When we think of the local church, we need to go beyond what we might commonly consider the local church. So what do people often mean when they say, hey, that's my church or that's their church? Typically people mean, hey, that's where that person worships on a Sunday morning. Hey, that is where the person goes to hear a sermon week in, week out. That's my church. That's their church. But as we can see from the statement of faith here, we're drilling in a bit deeper. The local church isn't just, hey, everyone who's there on a Sunday morning. And I think that's something we all intuitively know. We wouldn't say for a person just visiting one odd Sunday that that's their local church. We'll say, oh, they're visiting that church. Or even if, uh, let's say, a person is visiting their family for three months and they're regularly attending a local church, we wouldn't say that's their church because we know that they're not committed to that body. We know that they're not a real part integrated within that family. And that's exactly what's going on here. When we're speaking about the local church, we're not only speaking about people who attend, but we're speaking of a discernible body, a body that can be recognized. And this statement of faith tells us how you recognize the body that forms the local church, going beyond whoever's there on a Sunday. First of all, the local church are believers. A local church is made up of people who believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That might make sense. Okay, the church, a local church, is people who believe in what the church believes, believe in Jesus Christ, that main feature of Christian churches. But more than that, the statement of faith says they're immersed believers. And of course, this gets into Baptist distinctives on baptism. If you were to flip back in the statement of faith, you could read about our statement on baptism. And I'll leave a link to it down below if you're interested on that. But we believe that believers are recognized by other believers by their baptism. And this is probably something you're familiar with or heard before. Baptists will often say uh, baptism is your declaration of faith. It's how you make your faith known. Typically, you read your testimony, but more importantly, visibly and publicly, you are plunged into the water, buried with Christ, and raised to new life in him. So, the local church, it's believers... Believers who are known by their baptism, but more importantly, for membership itself, it's these people who are voluntarily associated for certain things. And that's a critical point here, and this is where we get to the first key term. When Baptists speak of the local church, we'll often speak of a regenerate church membership. Regenerate meaning the members of the local church, what makes up the local church, are believers, actual believers. And it's not only believers, it's believers known by their baptism and who voluntarily associate. And that voluntary association is membership. 
So what does a membership do? Why are they voluntarily associated? Well, if you look at the statement again, and if you're watching on YouTube, I'll have it up on the screen again now. The local church assembles associates for the following things. For the ministry of the word, the mutual edification of its members, the propagation of the faith, and the observance of the ordinances. So when we look back and see that this company of believers is called out from the world and separated unto the Lord Jesus Christ, that might sound abstract, but here we see it's rooted in actual activities. The ministry of the word. The local church voluntarily associates to receive and put forward the ministry of the word. Think about the preaching of the church. We voluntarily submit ourselves to the word. It's the word being read, the word being preached, obeying the word, and all those implications. Not only that, the mutual edification of its members. When you join a membership as a believer, you not only commit to edify one another in the sense of positive discipleship, of growing together, you can think of Bible studies, prayer meetings, times of fellowship, but also in cases of discipline, when we need that sort of help where, hey, if you run into an issue with sin or struggle with sin, you commit yourselves to the body to be disciplined by the body, which is, of course, a wonderful thing. But we also gather together for the propagation of the faith. The membership is committed not only for its own edification in itself, but also to preach the gospel unto those outside the church. And outside the church meaning whether it's people in the building who aren't believers in the building, not committed to a church, but also out in the community. Finally, the observance of the ordinances. And this is a, something that uh, is worth discussing where it's often neglected as we conceive of churches, local church, but a critical part of the church's life and mission is the practice of the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism is the way we the church grows. It's the way the family of God extends itself. We preach the word, people come in, and they are baptized. That's how they join this company. That's how they join this family, this local church. And the local church's life is constant in the taking of the Lord's Supper. That's often a neglected point, something we talked about on the channel before, but a regular part of church life, an important part of church life, it's coming together as the church and taking the Lord's Supper, receiving the Lord's Supper. As it says in scripture, that's the way we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's critical not only to who we are, but what our mission is. So that's the local church. When you think of the local church in a Baptist setting, it's a regenerate church membership. It's not just the people who are there on a Sunday morning. It's the people who have committed themselves to the body, who have voluntarily associated together. They have submitted to one another for the sake of Jesus Christ, out of the world to Jesus Christ, and they are defined by their set activities, which God has given to us, whether it's the ministry of the word, the propagation of the faith, the mutual edification of the members, or the practice of the ordinances. So that is, in a nutshell, who the church is in a Baptist context. Not just the people who are there on a Sunday, but the people who have committed themselves to a membership. They are believers known by their baptism, voluntarily associated. And as I close that point, that's a lot. I'll again, check out the, this description down below for some articles on regenerate church membership, why we do it, what the Bible says about it, what we're really going for here. But an important thing to note as Baptists is that we emphasize that voluntarily associated, where out of the world committed to Jesus Christ, but voluntarily associated. And what is that in contrast to? What's going on in the back of our mind? Well, thinking about Baptist development and congregational development, again, thinking back to John Cotton and his defense of congregationalism, a key thing here is it's a voluntary association. So, for example, this rules out national churches, whether you're just born, and the classic example in the English-speaking world, just because you're born in England, for Anglicans means uh, historically, hey, you're born into the Church of England. Baptists are saying, no, just being born in a particular region doesn't mean you're part of that local church. This is voluntary. You have to come out of way. You have to believe, be immersed, and voluntarily associate. 
The other thing in the back of the mind, not only national churches or state churches, is the concept of what about children of believers? A key thing here is it is, again, not by birth, whether by citizenship or by parental lineage. Just because you're born to believers part of a church doesn't mean you're automatically part of the local church. Again, you have to believe, be immersed, and voluntarily associate yourself. So just being born in a region in a national church or being born to parents who are believers doesn't make you part of the local church. And that is a key distinctive of Baptistic congregationalism, that we are this body called out from the world by Christ, and it's built upon our individual salvation. But then in that individual, we're saved as individuals. Christ calls your name. He knows your face. He calls you unto himself as his particular sheep. But you then join the body. You join the flock. You join this broader community that is essential to your walk and faith as a Christian believer. So that's the ecclesiology. That's the local church. That is the body of Christ in a particular area. Moving on from there, we are now going to talk about, okay, so that's who the local church is. But how does it fit into the broader church scene? So here, let me read the next section. We believe it is a sovereign, independent body, exercising its own divinely awarded gifts, precepts, and privileges under the Lordship of Christ, the great head of the church. If you were there for or you listened to that recent episode on John Cotton's defense of independency, this sounds very familiar. What it's saying is that company of immersed believers, voluntary associated, they are an independent body. Christ is directly the head of local churches. They answer to Christ directly. And when it comes to their operation, they don't answer to any human authority above them. And that, again, is the key distinctive of congregationalism. And I think here it really helps to, again, outline what is this in comparison to? What's floating around in the context here as you think about Baptist and congregationalist history? While the two major forms of church government that congregationalism is distinct from are First of all, Episcopal polity and Presbyterian or Presbyterial polity. What are those terms? Well, here is the basic rundown of very complex uh, polity church governance uh, discussions. Episcopal polity is, as the name suggests, uh, if you know the origin of words, I guess not immediately seen, but it's the rule of bishops. You will have individual local churches, but all these local churches answer to a bishop above them. The bishop is the one in charge of the diocese. And of course, uh, it's not as simple as that. And there are many different forms of Episcopal polity, as some of you might imagine. The way Anglicans practice Episcopal polity isn't quite the same way Roman Catholics do or Eastern Orthodox do or many other denominations with higher up bishops. But The basic rundown is, and this is more Anglican-minded since that's typically my context talking and speaking with Anglicans, you'll have an archbishop who runs a province. Under them, you'll have bishops who run various dioceses, and then you'll have churches, each church being run by a rector who's in charge of a congregation. Within that, you'll have all sorts of different positions, councils, local churches will have vestries and parish councils and all sorts of different things. But essentially, Episcopal polity has local churches submitting to a single bishop in charge of a group of churches. So that's Episcopal polity. The other major polity that's distinct is Presbyterian polity. Instead of having a single bishop in charge of a group of churches in a region, Presbyterian polity has a presbytery, a group, a synod, a a group of elders representing various churches who control or run the region. So while it's not a single individual, you have this higher court above the churches, where if issues happen in the local church, the presbytery above them in a region can instruct them, can correct them, can guide them down a path. Like a bishop, instead, 
it being a council. And of course, there's a lot more. There are various Presbyterian or Presbyterial uh, forms of this. How it looks in Dutch Reform, Continental Reform circles isn't how it looks in more Scottish Presbyterian uh, traditions. But essentially, you'll have churches which an answer to their local sessions, their elders boards, which in turn answer to presbyteries above in a region, which in turn answer to a gem general assembly, which typically gathers once a year, as I understand it anyway. So that is essentially the Presbyterian structure. Again, there is a hierarchy, a human hierarchy above the local church. The critical distinctive that we see here articulated in the statement of faith, again, it's on the screen if you're watching on YouTube now, is that the church, the local church, that company of immersed believers is a sovereign independent body. There is no bishop above the local church. There is no council above the local church. The local church is in Dependent. And as we talked about in Cotton's work, it's independent from human authority, but entirely dependent upon Christ's authority and his law and his good gifts. And that, of course, the good gifts are talking about, this is a big thing in Cotton, all those wonderful gifts Christ gives to his church to allow them to function to allow them to conduct their various ministries, all the way from the word to caring for one another, to fellowshipping. And that is the critical point of congregationalism. While we might have horizontal relationships and often do, again, check out the description on Baptist associations, churches will work together as equals, as partners, but they don't have standing bodies above them like other denominations will. There is no council or bishop that my local church is answering to if we run into issues. We might seek out the help of other local churches, but there's no bishop who can unilaterally uh, replace our pastor. There's no presbytery above us that can discipline our church if we run into issues. We are given what we require under Christ, and we make wise use of our horizontal relationships. That's a key point, and if that sounds difficult to imagine, or if you're thinking about it, I highly recommend first check out that episode from Cotton's view of independency, his defense of it, but then I'll also have some more resources about, and this is a key term again, the autonomy of local churches. That is a term Baptists will use, autonomy of local churches. We don't answer to other human authorities. Let's move to that final statement, and this is where we get into the deeper polity discussions of inside the local church. I'll have it on the screen again, and let me just read it briefly. We believe that its officers are pastors and deacons. So it, again, is the local church. The local church has officers, leaders, essentially, and there are two classes of them, pastors, deacons. And that is a brief statement, but as a lot of us might be aware, or you might be wondering, there are a lot of questions and issues that relate to this, come around this, so let me just highlight a few. First thing to note is pastors, elders, and in the Baptist world and mindset, reading the biblical text, congregationalists believe bishops are all titles of the same office. So if your church has a pastor and elders and it's a Baptist church, know that pastors and elders, biblically speaking, are the same office. They have the same responsibilities and the same authority. What often is the case in Baptist churches, at least in my corner of the Baptist world, is that pastor is typically a title reserved to the elder who is on staff, who is preaching week in and week out, who has those office administration responsibilities, while elder is typically reserved for those who are lay elders. Lay elder meaning a term that being a pastor isn't their primary vocation, that they are voluntary. They're not on the staff of the church. So we use these different terms to discuss different, I guess, practical realities. But the key thing to remember is that according to the Bible, as a Baptist, I'm saying this, of course, according to what we understand scripture to be teaching, is that pastors, elders, and bishops, and of course, there's some disagreement on how to use that term, are the same office. So whether you uh, know, hey, that's the pastor of my church, or those are the elders, they believe, and the statement of faith outlines here, they have all the same biblically mandated instructions and authority. 
So that's the first key point. The second key point is that this office is distinct from the deacons. While you can look and look at uh, Timothy, those epistles, you'll see great pastoral descriptions. While the elders slash pastors are in charge of teaching the word and prayer, that being a big thing, deacons come alongside and they have a more ministerial in the sense of service role. They are literally the helpers of the church. They take care of those practical needs. If you look at the book of Acts, where deacons first arise, you'll see that the uh, apostles, the elder figures there, they were so busy with teaching the word, prayer, that it was a struggle when they also had to care for all the practical needs of the church. So deacons were elevated, elected by the, the wider congregation to help take care of widows and people who needed other help within the local church. So when you think of deacons, think of people who help with practical needs, uh, perhaps a deacon who helps take care of the church grounds, a deacon who helps take care of seniors and their particular needs, a, a deacon who might help with people who need help finding work or are unemployed or need help with uh, finding different situations like that. Deacons are the people who typically take on those service, mercy ministries of the church, freeing up the elders to focus on the teaching, preaching, and prayer of the church. So that's the big distinction. And why I bring that up, and this is more of discussion I know for my American friends, is that in Southern Baptist or American Baptist history, uh, deacons and the role of elders often got confused, where you'd see deacons often acting like elders and elders no longer really being a thing. But according to this statement of faith and what I believe the Bible teaches, elders are the office of teaching and authority and preaching, while deacons are an office of service, an office of mercy, taking care of those practical needs. A few other things to highlight here, we have to see that its offices are pastors and deacons. Well, it doesn't explicitly say it here. That gets into a bigger inter-Baptist debate about how many pastors should a church have. Some churches believe that there is one pastor who is in charge of the church, while other churches, such as my own, believe that there should be a plurality. And that's another key term to make note of, a plurality of elders, a plurality of pastors. And that means that there is no single lead individual pastor who runs or is in charge of the church, that they have others who are with them to keep them accountable, to encourage them, and to work together to rule the church. And that's often the plurality. And of course, there's a scriptural case for this, and there are, of course, other arguments, but check out that down below if you're interested. Why churches will have multiple elders, multiple pastors, there's actually a theological reason for that that gets into practical issues about accountability, about just realities of rest and work and different things such as that. So another key point, elders and pastors are working as a plurality. They're in my circles anyway, no particular individual has all that authority invested in them. The final thing to note is that within this structure where you have the congregation and elders who have authority within the congregation, there is disagreement over how that authority plays out. This is something I mentioned early on in our final point for today, that similar to how Presbyterians and Episcopalians or people who practice Episcopal polity will have different ideas about it, how exactly it should play out, Congregationalists also have different ideas how this uh, congregation elder arrangement should play out. On the far end, on one side, you have democratic congregationalists. And that's basically a point of saying, while there are elders and deacons, essentially all decisions in the church have to run through the congregation. It's democratic. So from the largest things to the smallest things, everything must be approved by the congregational, by the congregational vote or by the congregation, congregation's assent. And that's essentially a way of saying it's congregational-led congregationalism. It's the congregation who not only has the final say, but they have nearly the entire say. Way on the other end of that, in congregational discussion, you have elder rule congregationalism. And that refers to while the congregation is an independent body, it's the elders who make all the decisions. It's the elders who run the church from the smallest things all the way up to the elders determining who the next elders will be, who's allowed into membership, and they act on that on their own. So it's ruled by the elders directly. They control the church. It's all in their authority. 
within that, and of, of course you might have guessed this is my position and the position of many churches that are uh, in association with my church, there is elder-led congregationalism. Distinct from elder rule, this is elder-led congregationalism, and I'll have resources on it down below, but essentially that's a position in congregationalism saying, hey, the elders have been invested with authority, and that authority is real and practical. So most of the day-to-day, week-to-week decisions, the congregation trust the elders to take care of most of those. We don't need to vote on all of them. We're not congregational rule. We're not congregational led. Let the elders make all those decisions, whether it's changing the carpet color to what we're going to preach on, to what Sunday school curriculum we're going to use. But essentially the congregation trusts the elders to make those daily decisions without a vote or assent from them. But unlike elder rule, Elder-led congregationalism still understands the congregation is the final body, the highest body within the church. That is the true authority of the church in the sense that to ordain new elders, they first need to be elected by the congregation. To receive new members into membership, they must be approved and voted on by the congregation. To execute excommunicate someone from membership, to remove someone from membership, that's something where we need the congregation's approval. And again, that is discussed in Cotton's work. I suggest you check that out. But that's truly, in my opinion anyway, the middle path, where it understands the elders have a true responsibility to lead and run the church day to day, make all those nitty gritty decisions or those high brow theology discussions. But when it comes to the church's extension of itself, whether through new elders, adding or removing members, the congregation has the final authority. They are the final accountability, where if the elders are acting out of line, the congregation has the ability to remove them and keep them in check, so that you really have a connection between elders and congregation, where they work together, keeping each other accountable and building each other up. There isn't a hard distinction between them. So, Elder-led congregationalism, that's a big topic. That's a very brief explanation. If you're interested in that, check out the resources I have down below and leave me a comment. On anything I've said in this episode, that has been a very quick take, but hopefully a take that gets you some insight into some of the language and key points of Baptist congregationalism today. Check out those resources down below. And if you have any questions about any of it, any comments, any statements, any requests for future episodes, get in touch with me, leave a comment on the YouTube page, send me an email, uh, reach out to me, Facebook, Discord, wherever you have me. Happy to hear you out, happy to perhaps have an episode in the future, and happy to continue the discussion because that's what this is. It's a conversation with me, you, and all of our friends and family in church history. Anyway, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you will join me again next time on Christian's Colloquy. We're almost done our series on congregationalism. Uh, next time will be a Q&A. And up in the air right now, but I'm hoping to have an interview to close out the series where we can hear a congregational voice from a different denomination, a different tradition who shares my convictions, our convictions as Baptists on congregational polity. Anyway, that's it for now. Take care.